A. Edwards of Lonesome Lake, British Columbia, self-reliant frontiersman and pioneer in the tradition of Lincoln and Boone. This is your life. They called him the Crusoe of Lonesome Lake. The name fits a man who cut a homestead out of the bush country, raised a family, and literally gave wings to his dreams, despite all the odds Mother Nature could muster. This is the story of Ralph Edwards. nature and uh, had that as one of his uh, objectives in life, why well, no doubt uh, nature could be brought back to some state of uh, beauty of one kind or another. Ralph Edwards was born in North Carolina, but his roving missionary parents molded him into a child of the world. During a trip to India, he fell in love with the majesty of mountains. In 1912, the young man on the hunt for his own home heard of alpine country in British Columbia free for the asking to homesteaders. Helped by local trapper Frank Ratcliffe, Edwards hiked into the Atnarco River Valley, about 380 kilometers northeast of Vancouver. He looked down at a beautiful, narrow, seven-mile stretch of glacier-fed water. Edwards had found his Shangri-La. In a twist of unconscious irony, he named it Lonesome Lake. The five foot five little chap from Carolina started chopping down 10 story tall cedars to establish his claim. He built a tiny cabin, beginning six solitary years of taming his wild valley. The closest road was 48 kilometers away, so everything had to be packed in along treacherous trails on his back or on a sure footed horse. Well, it wasn't until we climbed down and crossed the valley and came over here and looked around through the bottom here that I decided this is what I wanted. It's peaceful. The country here is peaceful. He was in his 80s when Ralph Edwards' adventure with life ended in 1977, but his exploits did not go unnoticed. Many years earlier, writer Leland Stowe flew into Lonesome Lake to do a short story for Reader's Digest. Stowe compared Edward's struggle against the B.C. wilderness to the character Robinson Crusoe. Stowe was so impressed that in 1957, the story became a book, The Crusoe of Lonesome Lake, and Ralph Edwards became a living legend. Stowe lured Edwards out of his valley for a flight to Los Angeles, supposedly to meet Hollywood producers about a possible movie. Instead, Ralph Edwards got the surprise of his life on Christmas Day, 1957. Now back to This Is Your Life, Ralph A. Edwards, who, battling grizzlies and 40 below zero cold, wrested a home from the wilderness with little more than his bare hands. Ralph struggled against a short growing season to coax a meager crop of vegetables from the ground and laid out trap lines for his main source of income, the skins of beaver, otter, mink, and marten. Life was not easy, but there were strong hopes for a rail line through the valley, a link with the outside world for supplies and mail, and a way to sell his produce to markets over the mountains. But World War I commandeered the money set aside for the railroad and called Edwards a way to serve. He yearned to pilot one of the double-winged flying machines, but his telegrapher's training landed him in the radio corps. When Armistice Day signaled its temporary peace, Sergeant Edwards headed back to his own tranquility, the lake he called Lonesome. He reset his energies to developing his land, but despite many hours of work, the days were too long without someone to share them. In 1922, on a supply trip to the village of Furvale, he met a slim teenager named Ethel Hober. Ralph's courtship demanded 64 kilometer hikes before he could spend a few hours regaling Ethel with his pioneer's dreams. 
A year later, Ethel married Ralph to share his joys and tragedies. And Ralph used to walk 40 miles each way across frozen lakes and rivers to court me. Well, now, this is the biggest surprise of all. Mr. Edwards, you thought she was still at Lonesome Lake, the lady of pioneering stock who on August 22nd, 1923, became Mrs. Ralph Edwards. Here's your wife. <laughs> Ralph Edwards was not the only one attracted to Lonesome Lake. Trumpeter swans gathered here for winter feeding in the shallow river water. But European fashion demands for their prized plumage as quill pens, hats, and pillow stuffing almost killed them off. With financial help from the Canadian Wildlife Service, Edwards' feeding program fostered Lonesome Lake's flock from 32 to 500. The world took notice. In 1952, five of his trumpeter swans were sent to Queen Elizabeth for a new home in her wildfowl sanctuary. Twenty years later, Edward's adopted country recognized his conservational work with the Order of Canada. They're one of the beauties of the world. They're one of the things that makes life worth living. They uh, are also very... Uh, get very tame here in the winter after we've been feeding them a while. They'll come right up and t take the green right out of the sack. And you're uh, right under your nose. And they got onto this routine that this grain appeared in the river at a certain time of day. So then they'd be there at that time. Up here when the, all those things are frozen up and the hills are covered with snow, why, that's a touch of life. On his own in the early years, Ralph battled the loneliness by referring to himself as we. And Ethel fought off her husband's long absences on the trap lines by chatting to imaginary visitors and the wildlife. Eventually, three new voices were heard in Lonesome Lake, Stanley, John, and Trudy Edwards. We'll meet them and learn more about the Crusoe of Lonesome Lake after this. Getting to Lonesome Lake remains a challenge, especially for a documentary video team loaded down with a lot of equipment. passed up a 37-kilometer hike along the trails in favor of a bush plane to fly us in from nearby Nimpo Lake. Dropping into the Atnarco Valley from the high ridgetops of the coastal range, there was an immediate sense of seclusion and some anticipation of dusting off history for what could be the last opportunity to profile this pioneering B.C. family. John Edwards spends most of his time in the area. His passion is being the family's self-appointed historian and curator of the crumbling remains of the Birches, the Edwards homestead. His father began this home on his own. Also alone, John is trying to restore it. He's the most worldly of the three children. His interest in photography took him on lecture tours across much of North America, telling his father's story through his pictures. From the time that I first saw pictures, experiences that I had in my comings and goings in the valley here, things that I saw that I just wished that I could record to look at later or to share with other people, this is what uh, triggered my interest in photography. It's hard to share the brilliance of John's memories. The cabin and its contents are musty and cluttered. Everywhere there is evidence of nature trying to reclaim what it once gave up to the Edwards. But five people lived in this rough collection of cedar logs, pitting their ingenuity and commitment against daily problems that dared them to give up. Now, this wasn't meant to be a house initially, was it? Well, Growing. not a people house. Yeah. Uh, that had started before the old original house burnt for a chicken house. 
And then when, when the, uh, the people house burnt, the one that was over there, well, he already had this building started. So he went ahead and... and uh, now there's been additions it. to this. What was the original size when the family the moved in here the after the, the fire? The original size was just this part here. Oh. Just one room, 10 by 20 feet. And that, that was home throughout my childhood. That's pretty close quarters. Well, you learn to be tolerant that you don't, you don't live long. <laughs> the folks understood that due to the lack of uh, availability of formal education, that we'd have to uh, pretty well get it by ourselves. And the key to learning is reading. Reading along with that, uh, we started arithmetic. Dad made up our own problems right here, related to things that we knew here. For instance? Uh, how many horsepower would it take to lift a stump uh, weighing 13,576 pounds, uh, 13 feet onto a stump, onto a pile to burn it? So it was practical mathematics. Practical mathematics, but related to things that we could understand and picture in our mind. We all had our projects, and uh, playtime in the sense that sitting playing marbles half a day? No. Playtimes in building things that we wanted? Yes. Oh, say a wooden box trap to catch a squirrel, for example. I tried to invent and design a hand-powered uh, propeller to drive a boat. <laughs> yeah, the uh, hay barn had its disaster also. Because that was where Dad and I slept for a sleeping room because of the one small room here. And uh, this one winter is our all-time record snowfall, six and a half feet accumulation. And Dad was away on the trap line, and this, and this one night it was so nasty. But mother decided to put me to bed on put of her bed in the house. The next morning, the hay barn was flat. She just pew. from this post across is 30 feet. There's a 12-inch square squared timber across the plate. But when we were rebuilding that, I was born in 1927 and 1934. That would be seven years old. Mm -hmm. I walked that when we were putting it up. Visits from people outside Lonesome Lake were few. Among those who did come in were Ralph's brother Earl and his wife Isabel. At 85, she's the only surviving Edwards family member from the original generation that settled in the area. Mm -hmm. Isabel now lives in Hagensburg, near Balakula, downriver from Lonesome Lake. Author of her own book, Ruffles on My Long Johns, she keeps crisp memories of those days. I was in a strange territory. I had never lived in the wilderness and it was difficult for me. I was terrified of everything including the snow. Every snowflake was a menace to me and I was frightened of the of the isolation. It, women in those days uh, went with their husbands and they supported them and, and uh, it never ever occurred to me that I just couldn't take it anymore. They shared everything that they had with us and, that, and what they had was so little. And I wondered why Ralph had wanted to live in such an isolated place and why Ethel could be so happy there. And Ralph himself was, es was escaping from a city life that he loathed. I read somewhere that somebody else's impression of him was Socrates wading through the water when he went, went, waded out into the lake to help moor a uh, plane that had landed up there. And Ralph was an intellectual with a gorgeous forehead, and all his movements were vigorous and quick. He walked with a very quick step. Life was very real and earnest, and you didn't fool around it with life up there. I was willing to work hard clearing land under difficult conditions rather than doing it the easy way. He should try to keep the environment as near natural as he can and still find sustenance. But you know, the odd thing about, about living in the wilderness is that you're so busy surviving that you have no time for introspection. And I never ever thought about it because we were so occupied with clearing land. And we were physically tired, we slept well at night, and, and our lives were contented. And I think it was that way with Ralph. <laughs> Now, things uh, got a little crowded in the main cabin there, so this is your own. 
When did you make this one? Well, I was 11 years old. I got tired of living in the in the little building that I was sleeping in with just an open shed. A little shorter than you are now, too. Well, I, was only, I was only 11 when I built it, so. So what did you have in there? Just a, a cot for sleeping? Or? And a cot across that end yeah. and a workbench over here for doing carpentry work. You did carpentry work in here? Oh, yeah. That's what do you think I learned to use tools. <laughs> right here. Your own little shop and uh, That's right. cabin all in one. You don't have any refrigerators here, so what did you do with, with the food? Well, the small stuff goes in jars, and the vegetables and the jars go into the frost-proof storage pit, which we have here. Aha. Uh -huh. you got to love your food to get to it here, don't you? It's a long way to go for a baked potato, John. Yeah. So how far down are you down there in the cellar? Well, I'm standing on the bottom now. Yeah? Okay. Okay, now what else have you got down there besides potatoes? Jars and jars and jars here. Well, there's some home canned pears. Homegrown, home canned beans. All right. And this is all Lonesome Lake produce. Yeah. yeah. So this is the original cabin. This was the first Caucasian building at Lonesome Lake. Yep. Built in January of 1913. It was in late October when we moved in here, when the original house burnt. And uh, it would be right at the end of March or early April the next spring <clears throat> when we moved across into the what was then the new house. So you had to last through a, a whole winter? Through, through the whole, whole season, yeah. Now, just give me an idea of the lay of the land here inside the cabin. Okay, this was the, the pole bunk with a cedar bar mattress where my mother and dad slept that winter. And over in the far corner there was the, uh, the stones against the wall and hole in the roof for chimney. And uh, I think it was along here, I'm not positive, was the double deck bunk where my older brother and I slept that winter and my sister was, well, she was born in March. She wasn't a year old until we got out of here. So there were five of you in here all together. There were five of us in here the that fire. Winter. Yeah. Really forced you to uh, to get along when you had to live in quarters as close as this. Well, there's only one place to go if you don't. And that's out, out in the cold. <laughs> Not in the middle of winter, thank you very much. No, oh. thank you. You've got a lot of dreams, though, John. I mean, you've also got dreams of, of restoring all of this, don't you? Well, I hope so. Yeah. It's a big project that's going to... The only substance to my dream is to leave for future generations the values and the lessons of the generation before me. What are the values? Recognition of the fact that all life forms are interrelated. Recognition of the fact that there's little that a human being can't do if they uh, do their homework and then apply themselves and stick to it. More people give up than fail. So nobody failed here? Oh yeah, many times, but we never gave up. <laughs> <laughs> when we return, we'll meet Trudy, the trumpeter swan's best friend and the second bride to homestead in the land opened up by Ralph Edwards. She was a chip off the old block. The two boys were not at all like Ralph. Trudy was just another a feminine Ralph. And they worked together as a pair, a team. When Grudy was 18, she was telling her father how to do things. It, it was simply wonderful. in the river singing at night to have big concerts when it's cold and clear at night. I think that's the part of the 
strongest early memory. Ralph Edwards gained the fame for helping the trumpeter swans escape extinction, but it was daughter Trudy who got the responsibility. For most of 56 years, it was Trudy who handled the winter feeding every day, seven days a week. We had to take the grain in a bag and put it in the river and get it wet because nobody knew if they could handle dry grain or not. Overnight and then the next morning you go and drag this wet drain bag out of the river with your hands, bare hands, and you throw out the drain into the river for the swans where it's shallow enough that they can eat, which is less than three feet of water. And it's quite a cold job. Every year, Trudy would file her reports with the Canadian Wildlife Service, tracking how much the swans ate and the matching weather conditions. With the help of conservationists like Trudy and her father, the trumpeter swans grew back from extinction so well that the CWS decided to stop paying for the grain feeding. Wildlife biologist Rick McKelvey. I don't know that we want to appear cheap in trying to get ourselves out of this contract. You know, the, the funds aren't the biggest issue. It's biologically not justified anymore. 4500 a year is what it costs us. You know, that's not a lot of money, but in terms of what needs to be done for conservation, that probably can be spent much more effectively in other areas than feeding swans that don't need to be fed. It may take a few winters before the swans realize they can't depend on the Lonesome Lake grain supply anymore. Trudy wonders how many swans will die before they move on. I personally don't think that they will move as, well, they didn't move this year when I delayed feeding for two weeks longer than I usually do after it froze up, after the, all the water away here froze up, river and everything. And I personally think that if we want to keep them alive, that we'll have to feed them here. Over the long association with these birds, Trudy never asked for the recognition given to her dad, Ralph Edwards. Instead, she concentrated on another trait passed on from father to daughter, a quiet dedication to the job at hand. It'll be a hard act to follow, wouldn't it? To have your father idolized the way Ralph has been, and with all the publicity, and they, the kids weren't any part of it. Trudy had independence enough to disassociate herself and go to her own preemption and live. I was happy to see there were swans in the country. Trudy met with us at the family homestead, about two and a half kilometers downriver from Arborddale, the farm she cleared and runs with Jack, her husband. For the first time ever, we brought television, battery powered, into the old Edwards cabin. It was an unusual scene, considering this farm rarely saw modern conveniences, including running water and electricity. We stood by as Trudy, John, and Jack watched our videotapes of TV programs about Lonesome Lake's Ralph Edwards. Emotion rarely betrays their innermost thoughts. The prime concern growing up here was survival and education. But these old images made an unmistakable connection with their past. Ralph doesn't feed the birds himself anymore. That job was taken over many years ago by his children. His daughter Trudy and her family who live nearby now carry on the labor of love. I don't know if I took after anybody, I think of myself. Though I see from that tape you had that quite a few of my expressions and everything were copied apparently right off my father, which I wasn't even aware of until I saw, heard him. He'd been in the military and he carried a certain amount of the military bearing. You do this or, and that. <laughs> she was much more uh, retiring. She didn't make much difference because he was pretty well the boss and she did, we, all of us did pretty well what he decreed. She didn't really like it here. She liked the country, but she didn't like the isolation. She was just overjoyed when people came, deliriously happy. But she did like the, the place, the environment, which she'd like with more people here. But she needed people a lot more than I do, even now. The people and the railroad never came in. But Ralph needed to get his farm's produce out to a market for his family's survival. And he'd always wanted to fly, so he began a long process of teaching himself aircraft design. He'd built virtually everything else on the homestead. Why not build an airplane? He studied and planned for 10 years until he learned his dream wouldn't stand a chance of cutting through government red tape. 
So with 3,000 hard-saved dollars, he sent Trudy out to Vancouver to get her pilot's license, buy a plane, and fly it back to Lonesome Lake. What amazed us was that Trudy went out. Well, how old was she, 18? Something like that. And she, she went out with a pack on her back, and she'd never been to the city before. And, and she went out and learned to fly a plane, bought one, and flew it home. <laughs> I didn't really believe it would happen. I've always had an interest in flying as far back as I can remember. We used to build model airplanes and try and launch them out of trees that used to crash. Well, when a float plane takes off, it's very similar to when a racehorse takes off, leaves the post, and both are very exhilarating. And I've done both. The airplane has a surge of power, and the horse has a surge of power, and I like riding horses. The valley looks quite wide from here. You get up there, and it's just a little narrow thing. Wonder how I'll ever get the airplane down that little tiny pond. Was it ever a problem? No. Nope. Well, I put it on the lake for a few times till I got the feel of it, but then I put it on the lagoon. It wasn't a real problem. What we felt sorry about was that her father usurped it, and Trudy had to give it up. Ralph just fell in love with it. It was a concession to his age. I let him have more of the flying, just because it's probably person sold her probably as hard as to learn things. And, but then they got married and, and sort of dropped out of it. And he had it all. Ralph Edwards was 62 when he qualified for his pilot's license. It opened up a freedom he'd never known and made him a familiar sight in the skies, delivering beef and produce from Lonesome Lake. A lot of people were shocked to see the grizzled face behind the controls, but the doctor who gave him his qualifying physical was shocked the most. The Crusoe of Lonesome Lake was in better shape than many men half his age. The tiny, bearded bush pilot put a precious value on his health and his airplane. To protect the fabric-covered airframe, he applied his log cabin talents to building the Lonesome Lake hangar. Throughout 14 years of flying time in the B.C. mountains, the Taylor craft was religiously rolled up into the hangar by a hand-operated winch after every flight. Yeah, that's the aircraft hangar. But the big problem in building it was uh, how to be able to get the airplane in it. He decided that they'd have to have the building out to where there'd be deep enough water, most of the year at least. So he, in the winter on the ice, he chopped holes in the ice and took the depths of the water from the ice down to the bottom, at the back and at the front, and got the, the degree of slope on the bottom. And then when he built it, he laid down mud sills and, and built that difference into the post up to the main plates at the floor level and the building on top. He built it sitting on the ice. And then in the spring when the ice melted, down she went and there she sat. Although Trudy's flying career was cut short, she filled the time feeding the swans and clearing her own tract of land, Arbordale, on a site upriver from the birches. It was the perfect place for someone with an independent spirit. And it's even less accessible than the original family homestead. There's no place to land a bush plane. So our video crew got a first-hand taste of what it must have been like over the years packing in supplies on foot. That meant hiking with our television equipment through the forest trail to the gateway of Arbordale, the homemade bridge spanning the river. It's a tribute to the engineering talents she learned from her father, and it beats wading across the glacier-fed water. Trudy's home site seems even more isolated than her parents' place. And like her father, she started her challenge against this wilderness valley alone until she met her match, Jack Turner, a man who was also willing to trade hard work for acres of elbow room. What was there about this fellow that impressed you? Well, I thought he might be able to do a lot of good work. <laughs> I don't really of course, know. I didn't have very much competition, you realize. <laughs> no. <laughs> The choice was limited. I was uh, favorably impressed, I guess, by uh, the independence and self-reliance that a person growing up here has to have in greater degree than people do in the city, because in the city you don't have to depend on yourself nearly as much as you do here.
Jack and Trudy's farm boasts few luxuries. One is her love for painting images of life in the Atnarco Valley. Trudy sells enough of the unpretentious canvases to support the hobby that colors her spare hours. The daily chores eat up most of their time. Strong backs and horsepower provide labor to grow crops and tend their small herd of livestock. Except for a few modern items like a gas-powered chainsaw, life at Trudy's differs little from the early days. But they wanted it that way. There's nobody to bother you in any way at all. And if you want to associate people, you make the choice to go and see them. They don't uh, thrust themselves on you because they're not here. It's up to you to go or there. So it has that uh, aspect of uh, Tranquility, it seems like you're 100 miles away, even though you're not all that far, really. It's just 70 miles to Bellacula, and it's just 25 miles to the road. It's like you're living on a remote island somewhere, really. Oh, easy, though. Well, a little more. Well, I wouldn't have an electric dishwasher. I got two perfectly good hands. I wouldn't have an electric sewing machine. I got two perfectly good feet. I wouldn't have an electric meat roast carver. Again, I got perfectly good. Anything I can do myself just as well, I wouldn't have anything electricity to do. The thing that it's potentially more dangerous than most things around here. Grizzly bears, there are a lot of them here. <laughs> Chasing chickens. We've had grizzly bears chase chickens around the house. Bears are just like people, they're individuals. And most of them will either ignore you or else run away from you, get out of your way because they're scared of you. But the occasional one will make trouble. And uh, it seems at the time when you make a decision to shoot when they're charging at you and you make that decision to shoot after they got quite close, uh, you shoot because you think you have to. And it can take you a, a matter of some days to walk out to medical attention, assuming you're able to walk. Uh, it does tend to always keep in the back of your mind that you have to be more careful than you otherwise would, and you try to avoid accidents rather than cope with them when you have them. Arbordale is up for sale. Trudy and Jack are simply getting tired of their contest with nature. Trudy's duty to the swan feeding program is ending. She and Jack realize the need to be closer to medical care as they grow older. And they want to be closer to their daughter Susan and grandson Brendan. Well, there is no future for Susan here. She tasted the big city of Toronto, but settled with her husband nearby in Hagensburg. Growing up in the isolation of Lonesome Lake, she felt the difficulty of dealing with the world outside. When I was really little, like two or three, I went through a stage of being really scared of people, but then I outgrew that, and it wasn't a, really a great shock, I wouldn't say. Was it lonely for you? I didn't really find it so. I, I mean, I didn't have anything else to compare to, and I had the, I liked the horses and stuff. I just sort of had them for friends, and. So you didn't miss having any, any girlfriends? Not, to not really. We had to try it taking a couple of girls from the valley up there one summer vacation. I was getting close to my teens and it didn't work out too well. I was, I was, I was, I was too set in my ways by then, I guess. <laughs> too much of a change for them or for you? Oh, it didn't, well, it didn't work out that well for them either, I don't think. But I mean, I'd been alone there all my life without any other young people around, so that's the way it was. Susan is of a younger generation, and she belongs to both worlds. But Trudy's two brothers, John and Stanley, have come away from that wilderness, and, but have never really adjusted to the newer life away from it. And uh, I think it's left their mark on them. Don't look at the camera. One, just nobody's in the country. Thanks, Stanley. That's fine. <laughs> well, I guess we can go to the barn. Yeah. Yep. When we return, you'll meet Stanley Edwards, the first son of the Crusoe of Lonesome Lake.
Stanley is a born naturalist. He, he communes with nature, and he belongs. He's a man of the woods, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see him striding through the woods. And, and he loves to talk about the animals, and he makes friends with them all. And... The Stillwater Riverside was Ralph Edwards' introduction to the area, leading to his homesteading at Lonesome Lake. Now, Stanley lives on this land, a gift from father to son. Like his brother, Stanley has remained single, but shares his Spartan cabin with pet cats when he's not carving up his own chunk of the wilderness. There's no lone, there's no part thing that's lonesome. You don't, I don't even so? know what the word means. <laughs> but you're all alone here most of the time. Here, to a certain extent, yeah. But I've got lots of things around, lots of life around here. It's not a place if it's on a desert island with no life of any kind. That'd be a different matter. Stanley left home at 17. For 30 years at the Ocean Falls Mill, he worked his way up the ranks of electricians. When his parents separated, he returned to the Birches to help his mother with her cattle. Upon her death, Stanley started work on his land at the Stillwater. He's slowly clearing it with the same dogged determination passed down from Ralph Edwards. What do you remember most about your dad, Ralph Edwards? I don't know if I ever thought one way or the other, neutral mostly. We all did what we had to do to get the place uh, running, keep it running. It's uh, sometime in the mid-1930s when things started to open up, we got books on airplanes, and each one of us built a model airplane. I built a model at a 24-inch wingspan, and it's exactly the same, except for it was in a glider configuration, as a B-52 bomber today. Did it fly? <laughs> it flew all the way across the field at Lonesome Lake. <laughs> Did that get you hooked on flying? <laughs> well, it meant that I was successful in my endeavor. When you walk into the clearing in the woods on Stanley's property, you're amazed by the size of his new barn. And the fact that he's building it totally on his own, using natural engineering talent to set winches and pulleys for raising the massive logs captured from the surrounding forest. His Aunt Isabel remembers that talent was there from an early age. When Earl and I came in, we had saved up the comic strip from the Portland newspapers. For a lot. We had a big roll of these, and they bored them. They had absolutely no use for them, whatever. The three children took me out to see their little trap line. This was an imaginary trap line on which Stanley had intricate little engineering projects that were quite beautiful. We, they should have recognized his engineering talent then. Here's the thing that I like to try to tell people. They complain about not being able to get an education. That's not true. I have a journeyman electrician, journeyman A class, PC certified. I have a pilot's license. I could ride a fourth class steam engineer ticket anytime I want to. I'm qualified to do so. Stanley came by his engineering talent honestly. The reminders of his father's efforts testify that Ralph Edwards was able to overcome whatever he set his mind to, like building his own water-powered sawmill, using his own materials, and importing only basic metal parts, like saw blades. Well, the mill. What's left of it? Gee, I hate that term. Yeah. What's left of it? This is the real brains of the mill system here, right? This is the core of it. Yeah. Now, where did he get the knowledge to do all of this, John? Out of his head. He didn't find it in a book or something? I don't think you'll find a book anywhere that tells you how to combine some birch boards and steel rod and make roller bearings. So necessity was the mother of this invention? Indeed. Now, that was, that was our theme song. <laughs> as long as I can remember, Mom used to say, necessity is the mother of invention. I realized very shortly in the experience of dealing with books that... Uh, Hardly everything was all put in one book, and the books often uh, didn't tell the same story all the way through. And the person had to use a certain amount of common sense in, in trying to go learn from books.
life up there was so real and so earnest, there was no time for sentiment. I know when Earl and I took all of February to go back and forth and back and forth with the, their yearly freight, Earl made a, a sled that we put it, piled everything in, and, and this lovely old coach horse from the caribou days, Old Blue, uh, who'd been such a faithful horse, dragged this up the lake on the ice. And then he was butchered because Ralph had mink to feed, and, uh, and he couldn't afford to feed another horse. This nearly killed me, and they, they actually cooked some of the meat. I finally took a bite of it and went outside and was very sick. But this was a fact of life. The mink had to be fed, and, and the horse had to be butchered. And it's a cruel life. I, I never really adjusted to it. Sometimes that cruel life took other tolls. Survival in this area meant hard work and high standards. And Ralph Edwards created a role model within his family almost impossible to follow. I want to get a little more of a feeling of, of how you and your dad fitted in together. How would you best describe the, uh, the attitude that, that you felt from your dad? Condescension. Mm -hmm. Dad never, seriously, dad never, or almost never, uh, acknowledged credit for anything I did. And believe me, sometimes it was hard. <laughs> and yet now, your ambition, your goal is, is to maintain his memory. But that's my relationship to him, not his to me. There's a difference, because we're both individuals and individualists. And uh, I think it, uh, see, Dad had some kind of an idea that because it was me, it was second class. What best describes your father? If, if I were to say to you, you're proud of your father because, finish the sentence. Because he always paid any and every penny he owed. He was honest. His word was his bond. In 1965, more than half a century after falling in love with his wilderness valley, Ralph Edwards left Lonesome Lake. Why? No one knows for sure. Perhaps the strain of isolation on family relationships or just plain fatigue from fighting nature for his foothold. Ralph sold the birches, ensuring permanent tenancy for his wife as part of the deal with the U.S. buyers. With the cash, he bought a home and a gill netter at Una River and spent much of his remaining years fishing. Ethel stayed at the homestead until ill health in 1976 forced a move to Bella Coola, where she died a few years later. Yeah, I, I was surprised that that he left because I thought he was pretty well in love with his place there. So I, I was actually surprised when he did move. But maybe it was too hard making a living. Or maybe he felt he wanted to be out with more people. It becomes a, a burden after a certain point in time. Everybody will find it. You'll find it too after you get old enough. I'll find it too <laughs> before too long. <laughs> The mark of the Edwards on this land is fading. Trudy and Jack will leave as soon as Arborvale can be sold. Stanley will also sell, but keeps on working the land to fill in his time. Only John cherishes the legend popularized years ago when Leland Stowe's book nicknamed his father the Crusoe of Lonesome Lake. He's produced a videotape history of the family based on his personal collection of films. By selling the tape, John hopes to raise enough money to restore the homestead, and perhaps more importantly, to feel a posthumous pat on the back that he missed too many times as a child. Meantime, John runs a wilderness camp at Turner Lake. It sits 600 meters up the mountainside from Lonesome Lake. He keeps his own share of memories here, like the weather-beaten reminder of his own flying days, what used to be a two-seater tailor craft. John dreams of flying again, but there are more immediate demands on his time. 
His first guests of the season are due in late May. There are rows of canoes to take out of storage and all the gear that goes along with them. They'll be used for excellent fishing. The wealth of trout at Turner Lake and in the string of lakes downstream is a product of his father's fish farming in an attempt to lure more fur-bearing animals for trapping. It started with just a few trout, and now they number in the millions. At least that's the fish story told around John's campfires. With no phones, TV, or radio, it's a perfect setting for captive camping audiences to hear all about the legends of the Edwards clan. Those stories are one of the few sounds to break the peace of isolation that was both a blessing and a curse to his family. John's life is a little different. The beautiful tape that he has made uh, shows that his love of nature and the animals too. It's given him a purpose in life. It's a burden that he shouldn't have taken on himself, but he has stubbornly and resolutely gone ahead with it. And I, I sincerely hope he succeeds. Look in the, in the world out there today, how many young people go astray? How many get their lives mixed up? Because it's tough. But there's tough things, the tough things here depended upon our own ability to do, to analyze, to work out, and to persevere. But not a type of toughness that uh, could corrupt and destroy us. They're just hard. Whereas the toughness in, in the, that young people today have to face out there in, in so-called civilization is a toughness that can literally destroy them. And they're to be pitied. A few years ago, John bought the homestead. He plans to rebuild it into a pioneer museum within Tweedsmere Provincial Park, a dream that would defy younger men armed with both more time and money. But John comes from a family where people aren't afraid to fly in the face of any odds at any age. So the story of the Crusoes of Lonesome Lake may not be over after all. Oh, we will be found where the beauty where the mountains tower up to the sky, where the trees are so green and the mosquitoes mean, and the glaciers are up there so high. Home that's dear to me in this beautiful valley. The sun shines so bright, and the snow is so white, and the scenery is so dear to me. Nothing was done here for the sake of doing it ourselves. Anything that was done here by ourselves was done because those were the only ones to do it. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs>